Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. And each quarter, we turn our focus to the Wilson Center's flagship publication, The Wilson Quarterly, with the help of its editor, Steve Lagerfeld. Welcome back, Steve. John, thanks for having me. Tell, tell us before I introduce our guests yeah. uh, what the article is that we're going to be talking about today. Well, this is an extraordinary piece that we're really very proud to publish. Um, and uh, I happen to have it right here. It's just out freshly on the iPad. Shiny and, new iPod. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and this is the story of, uh, of William Mawin, who uh, as a young boy in uh, Africa was swept up by uh, slavers and uh, spent um, many years in various uh, forms of, of slavery. Uh, and then made his way to the United States uh, fairly late in his life and, uh, and found its way to Melissa Pritchard, who we'll be speaking to, uh, a novelist and nonfiction writer who has told his story here in the most moving way that, uh, that I can imagine. Under the title, Still God Helps You. Still Which God Helps You. Which will make more sense to our viewers and listeners after this discussion. Right. And, uh, so joining us, as Steve said, is the author of the article, Melissa Pritchard. Melissa is a professor of English at Arizona State University and the author of eight award-winning books of fiction and biography, number nine, on the way in 2014, I hear. Welcome, Melissa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, uh, Steve set this up by calling this a, a remarkable piece, and I would echo that sentiment. Uh, a remarkable achievement both for the magazine, the editor, and, and for the author. Uh, let me ask where the idea for the article came. Ah, uh, excellent question. I I heard William's story first in 2006 when a young filmmaker who's also a friend of, of William. And this is in Arizona? Yes. And I got together for an almost an entire summer. We would meet in my office at my house and we would talk about uh, William's story. We began to talk about it and how to shape it. We saw it as a kind of um, quest story, a hero's journey. Um, it, it, we saw the potential in this story, it's a true story. and. Edward is, has gone on to work on a documentary about William. It should be done by next May. And uh, they started saying to me, you should write a book, Melissa, about this. And I said, oh, yes, in the midst of everything else I'm doing, sure. I should write a book. And I kept telling William I would write his story one day. I promised him for years I would write his story. And he would say, that's OK, Mom. I know how busy you are. He calls me Mom. I know how busy you are. And when the time's right, you'll do the story. So last summer, I woke up one morning, I went, um, it's time. Hmm. I just felt that it was time, and I started re-interviewing William over a period of three weeks every day uh, at my and house. And how did you fi find your way to the Wilson Quarterly? Interesting. Let me interject here, because um, Melissa found her way through one of my editors, Darcy Courteau. Uh, and Darcy had been uh, Melissa's uh, student in the past, and uh, they were still in close contact. And, um, and Darcy learned of, of this uh, uh, story, and, uh, and that's how it came to us. The, the, the reason I interjected myself here is that Darcy is the second Courteau to work at the Wilson Quarterly. We have something called a Courteau chair now. We'll uh, have a Courteau later in the program. Well, that's why I bring it up, uh, <laughs> just so viewers uh, aren't confused. Um, it's Sarah Courteau, who was previously our literary editor and remains that from, um, from uh, on a part-time basis from afar. Uh, will be talking to us later about a piece she wrote. So to put this in some perspective, you know, unfortunately, this is one of those stories, slavery, human trafficking, that doesn't get the attention it deserves. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, num a figure that you share in the article is 21 million slaves, a UN estimate which may be conservative. Is that correct? It may be conservative. Uh, that's the International Labor Organization, the ILO, which is an agency of the United Nations, came up with, recently revised that figure from 12 million to 21 million, and they, it could even be conservative, yes. Well, you know, I, I want to hear more about William's story, and we may do this in a nonlinear fashion, so okay. don't feel compelled to have to do it in a, in a <laughs> linear fashion, but uh, six years old, 1985, is when he's taken into slavery. What are the circumstances? How does this occur? It occurs he's staying with his grandmother in the village of Ajak. Uh, she had taken him in after he'd suffered a severe burn in a, in a house fire accident, and uh, civil war was coming again. In, in, it came in 1983, the second civil war uh, in Sudan, and uh, she thought he'd be safer in the village. 
and he had a really paradisical existence there. If, he, if you talk with him about it, he's just, he can remember great details of the river, of fishing, of the cattle, of how loved he was. It was really Edenic. And then one day he went to the marketplace with his uncle, and uh, the Janjaweed came in on horseback, uh, a large number of them, and swept up all the children um, and young women and girls, about 70, William estimates. And, and you write about how he'd never seen a horse, so he he'd was never somewhat seen a mesmerized. Horse. He was mesmerized by this horse, he, and he didn't understand what was going on. A man was shot in front of him, and he didn't understand the man was dead. He was six years old. He'd never seen any violence. And, um, and so that was, that was how it happened, and he kept thinking his grandmother would rescue him. For a long time, he would think, she's got to come and find me. She's got to come and find me. Uh, he never saw her again. The, the harrowing exodus you write of them as no. these, these slaves are, are transported uh, mm -hmm. via foot, walking, walking. And, and that only half survived the, the, yes. the trip. It was a horrific, horrific journey of 15 days to the slave market in Baba Nusa, and they walked at night, so they, first of all, they were also, cattle were with them, they'd stolen a lot of the cattle as well, so it was to keep the cattle comfortable, not the, not the children. Um, they were walking naked, barefoot. They slept on the ground, all tied together. Uh, if the youngest children were shot, the four and five-year-olds, because they were deemed worthless. Um, and uh, so only half survived, and then they were sold. And um, William spoke a few words of Arabic, so he was considered to be valuable. Uh, and he was bought by an older man, um, Ahmad Jubar. The, the, uh, the amazing uh, uh, level of uh, cruelty and indiscriminate violence against these children that you described. One thing I wonder, and, and getting to has no William as you have, was he instinctively good at survival? Because he seems, despite all the horror he's been through, as such a forgiving and generous person. And yet, in, in this initial encounter, he told you that if you smiled, you could be killed. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is your read on this? Was, did he just get lucky? Uh, is, as a survivor, or was he one of these people who just had a certain EQ that enabled him to navigate these horrific situations? You know, that's a mystery I've considered a great deal, how he survived and how he escaped. I mean, very, very few people, as children, escaped from this situation, and William did. And he seemed to always survive every challenge, every brutal condition. And I think uh, it's a combination of he's very intelligent, extremely intelligent and he thinks and he watches and he listens and he said in two circumstances in which he was enslaved he said to himself I'll be the best slave to my master so that he, I will earn his loyalty or her loyalty um, he did that deliberately you found it disconcerting strategy. that he used the term master so yes uh, I did and, and when I first was interviewing him he would say master he didn't he it, that's how he thinks of thought of him still referred to him as as master uh, he actually returned to Sudan to find him, to look for him. So th that, that's part of a remarkable part of the story, his mm -hmm. desire to see these people almost like a family reunion, not with any yes. malice. One of the mysteries about William that I think is, is in this heroic journey of his, uh, this quest story, this almost archetypal story of departure and return. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was a forced departure and an exile and suffering, a great deal of suffering, and then returning. Uh, is he has no malice in him. He reframed every experience in a way that he could say, if I hadn't been captured, if I hadn't been enslaved, I wouldn't now be speaking English, a college student in America, able now to return to Sudan as a guest of this, the government of South Sudan, able to offer jobs, able to help my people. Uh, departure and re departure, trial, tribulation, return with the gift. The gift is of himself. And so I've never felt any malice in him, any, any instinct for revenge. Instead, he talks about forgiveness, appreciation and forgiveness. He has a wonderful metaphor. He says, I wish, we were talking once, he said, I wish I could invite everyone to dinner and we could all sit down at a big table. And I just want to talk to everyone, and I just want to thank them and appreciate them and ask them why they did what they did. Why did they treat me that way, either for good or for ill? Um, so he's including everyone, the people who had positive influence on him, who helped him, like Father Tarticcio or Jim, who taught him English in Phoenix. Uh, Father Tarticcio, who gave him the name. His name, uh, William Wallace. Uh, Braveheart. Yes. 
the warrior who fought for the freedom of the Scots, right? So William was first named uh, Manuel Mawin after a long line of Dinka chiefs. He's actually a descendant of Dinka. He's from the Dinka tribe, Dinka chiefs, who are known for their gentleness, their justice, their kindness. Uh, so he was named after that. And then he was given the name William Ali by his Arab master. Then he was given the name William Wallace by Father Tartizio in El Obeid. He was a priest who helped street children. Um, he was actually baptized by this priest. And William said, who's William? Well, who's that? And he said he was a Scottish warrior who fought for the freedom of his people, um, which is another significant motif in William's life, fighting for freedom. A, a, another very poignant moment during yeah. that period with Father Tarticcio is uh, mm. when you describe him playing soccer yes. and having a moment of childhood amidst this non-childlike existence. Absolutely, absolutely. And then he would go to church every Sunday but not really understand what it was all about. He thought the communion wafer was food, bread. And he, he didn't understand the whole explanation for it. He said, it didn't matter. I was a child. It was food. And I went. And the church was peaceful. And the people were kind to me. Uh, you're not a, a, a journalist from afar in this story. You mentioned that he calls you mom. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this moment, this remarkable moment where you, you say some sort of inner voice or voice uh, compelled you to do something uh, oh. to get directly involved in William's life. That's another big mystery in this story and that I, I, was, I met William in 2005 and 6 and came to know his story. Um, I'm, I lead a very busy life teaching and writing and raising my own daughters and uh, so I'd lost track of him a little bit, but um, found out that he was working as a night security guard and had had to drop out of school and was having trouble paying his bills. I did know that, um, and I felt concerned. But anyway, weeks went by, and all of a sudden I woke up one morning. I woke up, I was awakened by what I can only call a voice, whether it was my conscience or something else, maybe William's grandmother. I don't know what woke me up, but I heard a very stern voice that could not be ignored that said, you must send William to back to school. You must pay his, uh, you know, William has to go back to school and you're to do that. I you called this, I'm going to read directly from what you wrote, one of the most irrational, least practical, <laughs> and finest things I've ever I've done. I've ever about. done. I trusted that voice. It wasn't a voice that could be ignored. It wasn't a message that could be ignored. Um, I called him that day and told him, William, when does school start? When does the next semester start? He already knew. Uh, and I said, go, go and register, and I'm paying for your tuition and your books. And he couldn't believe it. Now, what I want to say about that is I've always been concerned about suffering in the world and difficult conditions like many people. And there's nothing particularly honorable about me. And I probably, if I hadn't heard that voice, I don't know that I would have done that. I think sometimes, what if I hadn't heard that? What if I hadn't listened and trusted that voice and done that? Because the result of it, by helping one individual like William, who has never missed a day of school since, he lives for school, he has two more years to go. He just got his associate's degree. Um, he's now helping other people. His story is inspirational. He's, it's r the ripple effect from helping one person. Uh, has been extraordinary in William's case. Steve, not all of your authors are, are have such a pound of flesh in the stories they write about. It, it's pretty rare, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's uh, I think part of part of what makes this you know so compelling. It's, it it is all the things Melissa says, and uh, you know there's this sort of voyage and return, and uh, but but also the way that uh, their lives came together. I think is uh, is uh, a very moving part. Important There's something. Part of the story. Uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on that last line. There's something that you wrote that I'd like both of you to to reflect on a bit. As far as it, to me, it jumped out as maybe a statement about our times, yeah. where you wrote that closeness, after all, implies responsibility. That voyeurism doesn't. Yeah. You know, in the world of YouTube, and of uh, virtual realities, yes. uh, and, and perhaps it's the lack of that uh, uh, real involvement that can cause us to ignore big stories like this. That yes, are, because you feel overwhelmed by them and you think, well, what can I do? And, and, and I could turn the television off or I could turn the video off or something and then go back. I do have things to do in my own life. Um, but what William's story, his narrative, and I teach fiction writing, so I think in terms of narrative, his narrative is so remarkable in that you can turn it in any way, almost like a sphere. You can keep turning it and, and in every aspect you can gain, you can reflect upon it and gain a kind of lesson from it about one's own life and uh, 
on how to live a more human life, a more humane life. Um, and I think this idea of assisting one person, um, the effect that I've seen it have over the years. And when William first started calling me mom, I didn't know how I felt about that. I'd been a mother, I am a mother, and I have students, so I feel like even more of a mother. So I was like, another, oh, I don't know. What does that mean? What responsibility? What will I have to do? And then I just went with it. I just. It started to feel right? It started to feel right. Actually, it felt really right when I started interviewing William last, last summer for this article. And we became very close. He, he, he would tell me things and cry, and, and then he'd leave the house as if he'd l left a burden behind. What was the most difficult thing for him to speak about? Was it the incident where his, his arm is damaged and he loses his fingers? Yes, well, two things. The first, the two most difficult times for him to talk about openly and to tell me the details, and, and um, he did become emotional during both of these stories, was when he was captured, describing the little boy who was shot in front of him and died in front of him, smiling directly into William's eyes. William says, I can never forget that little boy. He was my age. Uh, he was my hero. He died trying to protect his sister who was being raped. Uh, that was very hard for William to tell. And then when we got to the day of his accident, 1999, August 1999, when he says, I left a part of my body in Egypt, in Cairo. It was a fact, he was illegally employed. Uh, there were about 200 Sudanese illegally employed in this factory. And uh, the owner put him, he was, actually went in to quit that day. He was going to quit. And the owner said, you can't quit till you work a full day. And he put him in front of a brand new machine he'd never operated before. And William said, I don't know how to operate this machine. And he said, figure it out, and walked away. And he got his arm caught. And then he, in trying to extract his arm, he caught. Instinctively reached with the other hand. Yes. And because he was um, um, illegal, he wasn't supposed to be in Cairo, in Egypt. He wasn't an Egyptian citizen. He couldn't be treated. It was hard to find treatment at a hospital. Uh, the whole story is harrowing. He had a hard time telling me that story. I could imagine. We, we have, I had a hard time reading about it. Yes. We, we have, a, a, shockingly, less than two minutes left, and I want to turn to the editor's prerogative here. Is there something else you'd like to ask? Uh, we're not giving away the whole story because there's so much more, and that's why you should read the Wilson Quarterly, but what else would you like to uh, Well, I, I, I would like to ask, when can I meet William? Uh, this is a really extraordinary story, and, and one of the reasons is he's, a, he's an, obviously an extraordinary uh, guy. But that, that's the question I have. When can I meet William? Well, he's coming. He's in Sudan right now. He's right. visiting his family in the village of Ajak, and he'll be back for school at Arizona State University in August. But he'd love to meet you. I, I really, t this morning I was thinking, I wish he was here right. with me or instead of me or something, because I'd you like have to meet him. I'd follow up where we can really. follow up. Really, that would be fantastic. He's an extraordinary I, young man. You know, before, before we run out of time, I, I just, uh, we should just say, the story comes full circle in that when he returns to Sudan, uh, he's now a hot commodity. They want yes. to hire him, offer jobs, yes. go from a slave as a six-year-old yes. to now being a potentially national hero of sorts. It's a, re a remarkable journey. Thank you for Thank the piece you that so you much. wrote. It's fantastic. Thank Steve, uh, you know, for an editor, I'm guessing it doesn't get much better than this. This is what we're here for, John. Yeah, yeah Thank terrific you. piece. Thanks again. Steve and I will return in a moment with more from the pages of the Wilson Quarterly right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. The spring issue of the quarterly features a series of articles around the theme, The American Quest for Redemption. Sarah Courteau is one of the authors of one of those pieces. It's titled, Feel Free to Help Yourself. Sarah joins us from New York. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. Hi, John. Hi, Steve. Let me, before we ask you specifically about the article, Steve, about this whole cluster. Yeah. What was the, the goal? What were well, you trying to talk about? John, we see uh, this idea of redemption as a, uh, we see it every day in our, in, our, in our lives. And it's, uh, it seems to be coming more and more on the scene. Right now we're looking at the, uh, the return of Elliot Spitzer, uh, you know, a disgraced politician seeking redemption. It's become an old story. Um, and we wanted to look at it at a kind of deeper level and look at sort of the historical roots. Why in America are we so prone to this? And we're very forgiving, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, but we wanted to look a little deeper. 
And Sarah, you, you tie this to the, the American dream. You say that the ethos of self-help is woven into American culture about aspiration. Yes, well, uh, I mean, it's, it's written right there in our founding document that um, we're right to the pursuit of happiness. And that's really the core of self-help. We are looking for um, the keys to a better life. And we feel that we have a right to um, a better life, a happier life. And um, that's really the, the core of this just multi-billion dollar industry now. Multi-billion dollar, you, you, you say 10 billion, I think, in the piece. Yes, and that's, that's a, actually, that's, that's counting self-help uh, books and programs and infomercials. They're, um, you know, that's, that's not even in counting things like in the dieting industry, all the food that people purchase as part of their, their dieting regimen. So it's a huge, huge industry, and it is uh, steadily growing, even despite the tough economic times. Where, where are its origins? Where do you trace this to? What, what was the first self-help book? Well, the first self-help book actually uh, was uh, across the Atlantic. Um, Samuel Smiles wrote uh, self-help in, in the, uh, the mid-1800s. Um, but it pretty quickly uh, made it, it, its debut here, and then there were there were books. Um, Dale Carnegie's "How to Win Friends and Influence People" uh, in the in the 1930s was a, a huge bestseller and um, really brought the this genre kind of mainstream. You know, it, it's interesting because there's a, a change in the genre too. I, I think of George Washington, actually, famously, he, he was a, a careful student of a European, a British, uh, what we would now call self-help uh, guide, but it was rules to live by. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was oriented not towards making yourself feel, you know, better or being, having a happier life. It was living towards, a virtuous life. It was living a virtuous life, you know, doing the right things, uh, you know, building character. And I think this newer... Uh, form of uh, self-help, which is what we know of as, as self-help, is very redemptive. Help I mean, yourself to a personal, piece of the pie, too. Uh, it's also about uh, achievement. Yeah, it's about many things. Very much yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you write about the, the movement from you to I. That's what I was anticipating right. you were going to talk about. <laughs> right. Is uh, Explain that notion that self-help was uh, you in the days of Dale Carnegie, and it became I, the author, and my wonderful example in the current uh, current literature. Well, that's interesting because that, that actually leads to where I became interested in, in the self-help genre, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm a literary critic by trade, and in the nonfiction uh, uh, broad category right now, what's really popular is memoir. And so many memoirs are about, um, you know, about a, a person's personal journey, often through some kind of hardship. And people read these not just for their literary value, but really for inspiration. And so it's a it's a small leap from something like uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love, which is hugely successful about her year uh, as a divorcee, uh, traveling the world and, and finding herself, to a book like um, also very very popular recently, Gretchen Rubin's The Happiness Project. These books kind of um, are representative of a, what I call a, a shift, a pronoun shift in the culture from, from you to I. When you look back at uh, the sort of founding tomes of American self-help, like, for instance, Dale Carnegie's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, the stories of inspiration are anecdotes. They're about other people there. and. There has been a profound shift now to the personal lives of these authors. They are what is, are now held up to us. And, and in order to make it as a self-help guru, you have to have a really good personal story. Were either of you uh, uh, attracted to self-help uh, literature before you were involved in putting together this article? Well, I think all of us, you can't avoid in American culture. And would you admit it if you were? Yeah. Maybe the other part? Well, I think, uh, I think you should talk to Sarah about this because I think it's one of the really interesting um, uh, uh, parts of her, her piece where she, you know, she talks about her appreciation of some of this stuff and, and she knows more about it than I do. She also talks about how you were apologetic with your friends when you were talking about what you've been reading about. Somehow it was not necessarily a badge of honor. 
Right. Well, I, I, um, I think it's interesting because our culture is so uh, obsessed with physical perfection and the pursuit of that. And there's absolutely no shame about being a gym rat, someone obsessed with eating well, uh, counting calories, all of that. But if you admit, at least in certain um, I don't, educated circles, that you read something like uh, like the Happiness Project and and don't kind of attach a uh, an asterisk to that in some way, a wink, wink, ironic mm -hmm. asterisk, then I do think that there is a, a people kind of give you a sidelong glance. And um, I, I just, I, but I think that, that we're not being really honest with ourselves when we do that, because as Steve said, self-help is woven into the culture. Look at, look at all the magazines on the newsstands. So many of them are, um, all the, the stories are about can't how open up uh, the New York Times. You know, you can't <laughs> exactly. open up the New York Times. Miss, exactly. You know, the gray, still the gray, uh, the gray eminence of, uh, of journalism is loaded with self-help uh, sort of stuff on any given day. Um, I was and actually we all, surprised recently and, uh, to see a story in the Times about how to have, have a sun-kissed look. It seems like really, um, oh, uh, What day was that, Sarah? Right. I don't know. <laughs> I, what is it? Final, we have five seconds. What's your final conclusion about the search for success and self-improvement in America? Well, as I, um, as I conclude the article, I, I think it's really important to uh, be able to appreciate self-help, but not to look to it for all the answers, because ultimately these people, as, as good storytellers as they may be, uh, don't have it all figured out. And um, we, don't even, we don't even know the full story um, as far as their lives go. Oh. All we know is, is what they've presented us. So they present us with a great story, but maybe not all Sarah, it sounds like you're on your way to being a self-help guru. There's the basis for a book. <laughs> right. Steve, Sarah, thank you. Put me on a, uh, thank yeah, you, John. a bookstore near you. <laughs> Thanks again. Until next week, uh, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org.